Live your dream. Do what makes you happy. These are the things that society often tells us when we're selecting a college major, choosing a job after college, or facing a career change. But what I've come to realize society actually means is chase the money and do whatever makes you look the most prestigious to people that you probably don't even like. It's a lot less romantic than they make it sound. You see, what society is actually saying is don't you dare chase your passion unless your passion conveniently comes wrapped with a nice job title, a prestigious salary, and plenty of job security. And speaking of job security, when I graduated from undergrad, it was into a field with a 90% job placement rate and a $65,000 starting earning potential. And when I graduate with my master's, it's into a field with a 50% job placement rate, a $50,000 starting earning potential, and an average burnout rate of three to five years for the 50% of us who even get a chance. It's a highly competitive, highly saturated, and highly demanding field, the field of sport administration. And I've probably adequately made you all think that I'm crazy. And that's okay, because my friends and family and community have said the same things. They've said things to me like, well, Steph, you really like sports now, but you know it's not a dream world, so wake up. Or my personal favorite, well, statistics say that you have three to five years, so live your best life, and we'll catch you on the other side at Procter & Gamble. You won't be too young to start a career then, we promise. And so, I would love to tell them that they're correct and that I won't be too old to start a career and that I'll be ready to see them in P&G, but I can't do that. Because while I liked my undergraduate courses well enough and I can nerd out on the topic of efficiency and logistics with the best of them, I would listen to my friends and my classmates talk about their internships and co-ops and they sounded like really excellent learning opportunities, but it always came down to them having to go to work but when I got the opportunity to talk about the job in sport that I was headed to after class, about the athletes whose lives were changing, about the role that I got to have with young people, it sounded a lot more like I got to be on mission. And so before I go any further, I want you all to think about what this life on mission might look like for you. What passion you have that you might wanna turn into a reality. I want you to think of what would get you out of bed happily on a Saturday because a lot of what I'm about to talk about has been me getting out of bed happily on a Saturday. And I want you to hold on to those thoughts. So my favorite thing about my role in student athlete development is my opportunity to look holistically at the youth that I serve as people first and athletes second, third, and sometimes even fourth to the things that we're working through. For those of you unfamiliar with this field, I get to develop curriculum that presents life-changing opportunities in the areas of fiscal management, time management, and leadership development. I get to affect and mostly witness life change in youth. And as a 21-year-old, I've seen life change that most of you could probably only dream of. In my role with Cincinnati Public, I've seen kids from the worst streets of Cincinnati go on to earn and accept college scholarships, and they have been proud of themselves on signing day. And I've seen college athletes' mindsets transformed into members of a community who value not just their name and their stats or their performance at the last game, but more so, their story. And I've seen youth of all ages transform into leaders and advocates for themselves and their peers. They've used these resources to go on and break generational curses of poverty, a lack of formal education, drug abuse, and alcoholism. They've changed not just their own story and their family's story, but instead their whole community. And I take no credit for the life change. I'm just grateful for the opportunity to witness it. And when I got my role in sport, because I would love to stop telling you right there where you could all jump out of your seats and excitedly go chase your passion, I need to tell you that when I got my start in sport, it was in a role that I was very, very uncomfortable with. I started out as the first female resident advisor for the men's basketball team here at the University of Cincinnati. And I was uncomfortable because I had never thought of my gender as a qualifier for my ability to do my job, but that narrative doesn't really seem to be changing as I am often the only female at the table. But I can't let that stop me because if I let it stop me, then I'm letting them win, and my gender does become a qualifier. 
But in my role as the first female resident advisor for the men's basketball team, I was challenged almost endlessly, questioned on my value and my intention, my ability. And the narrative didn't change in my first professional role. At Northern Kentucky University, the doubt was more intense. I was questioned because I'm white working with primarily black athletes because I'm a woman in a male-dominated field who happens to also work mostly with male athletes, because I'm young and having this much success at 21 is kind of scary to people. I was questioned because I was never an athlete, so how could I have a clue what I'm doing? But mostly I've been questioned because I still don't have a degree that says I should be able to do this. And I remember sitting at Christmas Eve dinner, the year that I was the RA, and I was sharing so openly like I am now that I had found my purpose and my passion, and I was excited. And I looked forward to my family being just as excited for me, and that is not what happened. Because my uncle stopped dinner to say that I was only in this for the attention that came along with such high profile athletes. And that I would very quickly find the next best thing and go back to my quiet life, whatever that meant. And I got really angry with him. And it's not something that I'm super familiar with. But I was angry and I had a lot of questions. Like, how could he so quickly belittle my passion? How could he summarize my purpose? How could he make such a statement about somebody that he saw two times a year? But I also got angry at myself because I sat quietly at that table. I didn't use my voice, but instead in my head I wondered, was this a mistake? And it's really important for me to remember my community in all of that. And so I wanna tell you about two of them, though two is not enough. I have a friend who turned down a four-day intensive career camp with the Major League Baseball for fear of getting behind at his current role. And I mentioned burnout before, and I want you all to realize that burnout doesn't always look like Facebook at work and yelling at your boss, but sometimes it looks like being so led by fear that you can't take a step out of what you're doing, and so you get stuck, and you get tired. And my friend through that experience has taught me that this industry will not wait for me to be done being afraid, and whatever my passion may be, it doesn't have time for me to be afraid, so I have to forget the fear and take the step and I'm grateful for that. And another one of my friends was so passionate about youth development and he saw so many flaws in the school system that he was brought up in that he started his own business. And because of him, there's curriculum in our schools on things like anti-bullying initiatives, things to make kids grow up better. And not only is he growing up our kids better, but he's growing up the influences of our kids better. The teachers, the coaches, the administrators, they're being built into by this man in ways that they were not before. And the city of Cincinnati is better for him, and I am better for his mentorship. And it's really helpful to remember these people and many more, but it's also really helpful for me to remember myself. So two years ago, I sat across from university officials, given the opportunity to wash my hands of sport and to say no more. A situation with two of the athletes that I lived with had gotten very out of hand. Legal counsel had gotten involved and they recommended that I take the plea, cry mercy and be done. I remember sitting across from these very important people in tears of what they thought were fear and exhaustion, but were actually tears of desperation for someone to listen to me, that undoubtedly I wanted to stay in my role. And I'll be honest, I thought I was crazy in that moment for the things that had happened to me, for the place that I was, but upon reflection, I realized that I wasn't concerned about the two who had developed, but they were still hurting others with their actions. But instead, I was worried about the 13 lives I had seen change, the 13 people whose lives looked dramatically better and different for the time we had spent together. And all I could think was that I wanted more of that. And because of that confident yes, I have seen hundreds of youth lives change and I would do it over again. So what would have happened if I had listened to the people who doubted me, to my friends and my family, my coworkers, to myself when I got really hard? I would undoubtedly have a really nice job, plenty of money, and a title that makes people very impressed. And a lot of people who love me 
would be very happy and their fears very appeased. But I want you to hear me when I say this. I chose this and I am very, very happy. I would always be wondering what if I had chased the dream, what if I had done what makes me come alive. And so I want you to hear me when I say this too. Regardless of the number on my contract, of the salary in the job description, of my statistical earning potential, or of my bank account, today I am living the $100,000 job because I am living confidently and purposely in my passion. And I believe that all of you have this in you. I believe that there has been something in your mind since I asked what life on mission would look like for you. What business do you wanna start? What idea do you wanna share? What invention do you wanna create? What impact do you want to have? You have to take that confident first step in the direction. Get coffee with someone who does what you wanna do and learn from their story because we don't have it all figured out, but with a little help from everybody, we can get there. Sign the patent application even though it's terrifying. File for the nonprofit, book the flight, go on the adventure, take the class, call the person and tell them the thing and I know that you know exactly what I am talking about. Life was not made for us to watch and wait and hope for good things to fall into our laps. It was made for us to boldly step forward confidently in what matters to us. Now I promise if you're actually chasing your passion, you'll face many obstacles as I have and certainly will. So I wanna encourage you to not be an obstacle to others on their journey, but to instead take the opportunity to be an encourager and to not be a doubter of their plans, but instead to be a champion because the world needs more encouragers and champions and it is empowering to be an encourager and a champion. This is your story and it's not theirs and it's not about making them happy. So be sure to write a good one.